Hello and welcome to today's webinar. The webinar today is jointly presented by Hydrocomp and Friendship Systems, and we want to talk about how the software tools NavCAD and Cases can be combined for the design and optimization of ship hulls. My name is Mattia Brenner, and I will guide you through this webinar on the side of Friendship Systems, and I'm joined today by Don McPherson, who will take care of Hydrocomp's side. Hello, Don. Good morning for you, I guess. Yes, indeed. Good morning. Um, very pleased to be with you here today, Mattia. And uh, let me extend my personal welcome to all of the participants. Thank you. So a few introductory words about ourselves. Uh, Don is the CTO at Hydrocomp, where he is responsible for the development uh, of the software and uh, the technical services that Hydrocomp has to offer. And uh, he co-founded Hydrocomp in 1984, so quite a while ago, and he has a background in naval architecture. Myself, I am responsible for sales in, in Europe and the Americas at Friendship Systems. I've been with the company for about 10 years, so a bit less than Don at Hydrocomp. And uh, many of these uh, years I spent working in the pre-sales and engineering team before I transitioned to sales. And my technical background is in naval, naval architecture as well. So let's see what we have on the agenda today. First of all, uh, I will uh, give a few words of introduction about Friendship Systems, the company, uh, what we do, and specifically about our software cases. And then Don uh, will tell us the same about Hydrocomp and NAVCAT. And uh, for the rest of the webinar, we would like to look at a specific uh, application example. And we will start to by presenting the case that we're looking at. And then we will talk about the geometry model that we set up for geometry variation. Then the calculation setup in NAVCAT and the optimization setup with the two softwares combined. And finally, uh, we'll uh, tell or discuss a little bit uh, the optimization results that we obtained for this case study before we wrap up everything. If time allows, at the end, we will have a Q&A session. And in that regard, there is also an announcement uh, to make. You can see in your interface, in your GoToWebinar interface, that you can um, type in questions. So whenever you have some question that comes up during uh, our presentation, then please uh, enter it there. And we will try to pick out some questions at the end in the Q&A. And if we don't answer your question, then we will uh, follow up after the webinar. So feel free to, to take that opportunity. So as I mentioned, let me get started uh, with my side uh, the, about the company Friendship Systems. The, uh, we have been working for about 15 years, uh, specifically in the fields of geometry parametrization and optimization. And we basically partner up with our uh, customers to solve any kind of problems that they encounter in a so-called simulation-driven design process or performance-driven design process. And um, we started working in the maritime industry and for the majority of the life of the company, we were focused solely on the maritime industry. And only in the last maybe five years, we started expanding also into other industries that are also dealing with, uh, let's say, flow, uh, optimization, geometry optimization problems, such as turbo machinery, powertrain applications, and so on. The, the company is located in Potsdam in Germany. And what you see here on the side is uh, unfortunately not our office building, but one of the beautiful palaces that you can see uh, in Potsdam. So it's certainly worthwhile to come to Potsdam, not only to visit us, but also to do some sightseeing. Um, our main uh, business is uh, a software product, which is a CAE platform called Cases. And I want to tell you a little bit more about that. So what is it that we do with this software? Cases is mainly composed of two uh, components. The first one 
is uh, everything that has to do with the optimization process. So to run an optimization, you need algorithms to drive the process. Um, a lot of data is generated, uh, geometry uh, data, uh, calculation results, and so on. So that needs to be managed. And uh, all that data uh, is also needed to make design decisions. So we need some assessment tools that we, so that we can sort through that data and draw the right conclusions. The second component of our system is the everything that has to do with the CAD uh, modeling and CAD description of a geometry. And here we have a very specialized CAD uh, tool in our uh, software that has a focus on providing a simulation ready geometry that can be used directly to run any kind of computations with it. Um, and most importantly, uh, we have a focus on geometry variation. So you have a geometry that you want to change in an automated process, and that should be easy and robust, as well as uh, yeah, described in an efficient way. And to complete the process, we provide the generic interface that can be used to couple uh, any type of external tool that will provide uh, some kind of uh, performance feedback about our geometry during the optimization. In this case, it will be uh, NAVCAD, and Don will uh, say a little bit more about that after my, my introduction. So uh, just uh, some, some questions uh, to get started. Why should I automate my design process? Uh, maybe it's more or less clear, but... Uh, the situation nowadays in terms of laws, regulations, but also the competition on the market uh, demand that the designs that are generated in uh, ship design have to have uh, a very high level of performance. And let's say an old iterative manual process is uh, not necessarily suited to achieve these, uh, these high levels of performance. So in, in this manual process, we would maybe create a CAD geometry, then run some kind of performance prediction calculation, CFD, or some other type of calculations, do post-processing uh, based on the results, decide to make some changes, um, and go back to the geometry, make uh, the modif necessary modifications. And that, of course, is time-consuming, which leads to uh, higher development costs. And it can lead to certainly an improved design, uh, but not necessarily an optimized one. So uh, that in the end, maybe it's not possible to reach the performance target uh, that has been set for that design. The automation, of course, uh, I think that's pretty clear now, uh, can shorten these development times, reduce design cycles, uh, reduce the amount of experiments maybe also. Um, and lead to better and optimized designs. I think that's, uh, so say, the opposite of what we heard before. But also an important point, I think, is that it can increase very quickly the knowledge about the product's behavior in the early design phases so that you can understand very quickly uh, what kind of impact uh, your geometry parameters have on certain performance characteristics. And one of the goals of cases is to give you a control over this complete uh, process, over this automated process from one uh, integrated user interface. Another point, as I mentioned, an important component of cases is the CAD modeling part. Uh, so the question might be, why do I need another CAD system? Maybe you already have uh, some CAD system for line design uh, and so on. And actually, from our experience, uh, we can say that most of the bottlenecks that we encounter uh, when people are trying to run a design exploration or optimization process are related to the handling of the geometry. So this could be the geometry variation is tedious, uh, so it's very time-consuming, difficult to made, make specific changes to the geometry, or it's prone to failure that uh, when you try to change something automatically, the uh, geometry uh, breaks down. Also complex geometries might have 
way too many parameters to uh, to be involved in an optimization process in an efficient way. Constraints are an important point. It might be difficult to consider or fulfill specific constraints that we have on our design during the optimization. And finally, if you're running, if you're coupling to, to, to a simulation or calculation tool, the quality or the, uh, the way that the, the geometry is available is not necessarily suited for that tool to be used right away. So if you want to run a CFD computation, you need to generate a mesh and uh, the geometry that you provide to the mesh generator might not be watertight. There might be things to clean up and that of course is not suited for uh, automation. So these are the things that we're uh, trying to address with our specialized system in uh, CAD system in cases. Finally, how can I make use of cases? In the context of marine applications, you can see here uh, a couple of examples uh, from going from sh ship or boat hulls uh, to energy saving devices, propellers, but also offshore structure, uh, renewable energy, systems that are located in the marine environment, things like that. And uh, you also see a geometry variation on the side. So I think, uh, or I hope this will give you uh, an idea of what we do here at Friendship Systems and what our tool is supposed to do. And now I would like to switch over to Don, who will uh, tell us a bit more about Hydrocomp and their system NAVCAT. Thank you, Mattia. Uh, ad advance, please. Yes. Uh, Hydrocomp is a is a small research consultancy with a uh, specialization, as I write down here, in operational hydrodynamic and propulsion system simulation. Well, that's a uh, that's a big phrase, but it it faithfully encompasses what we do. Uh, a couple of the important brand characteristics of Hydrocomp is that we focus on applied engineering as opposed to theoretical engineering. We take the work that is done in academic institutions and uh, research studies and we apply them and make them available for naval architects to use during their normal course of business. Now, of course, we have our own in-house R&D program that is very active, but that uh, tends to focus on the application of technology as opposed to the novel creation of technology. Although in the case of propulsor design, uh, we have a very active uh, novel R&D program in-house as well. We're located in Durham, New Hampshire. The, that's a short distance north of Boston. And as Mattia indicated, uh, we, uh, we were uh, founded in 1984. I was one of the founding partners. Uh, so we've been at this game for, for a long time and still continue to enjoy every day that we, uh, we do in this, uh, in this work. And, in this domain. Our activities at Hydrocomp are both in software and technical services. The performance simulation, the prediction of uh, resistance and propulsion and speed and power is our principal work, but we are actively uh, involved in what we would term forensic analysis, uh, trying to identify why ships and marine vehicles behave the way they do. Sometimes they're not performing up to expectations. Others, it's just a matter of trying to document some of the underpinnings and details of performance. And as mentioned, we're also very active in propulsor design. Uh, the little illustration that we have in the lower right hand is just an example of some of the work we do on uh, small thrusters, for example. We're uh, quite well known as, as a designer of uh, thrusters under, under one meter for ROV AUV applications, for example. The software, <coughs> excuse me, the software products that we're most well known for, of course, is NAVCAD, and we have 
two editions of that, the standard and the premium. And it's the premium edition that we will highlight here because of the interactivity that's necessary to connect with cases. We also have a blade element design code for propellers called prop elements. And we serve a large segment of the the international propeller manufacturing community with our geometric modeler called PropCAD. What we do in the context of this discussion is to provide that simulation solver uh, that was very ably described by Mattia in the CASIS setting. Uh, the software connection that we will describe here is a NAVCAD specific connection you know, for the simulation of not only uh, component pieces, but really more broadly, the propulsion system simulation. Uh, so let's proceed to the next slide and we'll uh, get into some of the details of what that particularly means. I would like to propose the idea here today that NAVCAD Premium is a critical simulation solver for marine design with cases. And there are, are, are three points that I would like to make uh, in support of that. One is that NAVCAD provides for simulation of the hull propulsor driveline engine system. And I want to distinguish between that system and the components of the system. Because at the end, what we're really looking for are system-based outcomes, whether that be fuel consumption or CO2 production or uh, minimum energy, the objective functions that we will talk about sometimes are component-based, hull and propulsor, but most often they are system-based. And NAVCAD gives you that framework for the hull propulsor driveline engine system to be able to absor observe and evaluate whole ship system across a mission-based duty profile, for example. Now within NAVCAD, in support of that system, we have a variety of fast and efficient, what we term 1D and 2D component performance models. And by component, I mean hull prediction models for resistance or hull propulsor interaction for appendages, for added resistance in seas. On the propulsor side, we have propellers, water jets, different kinds of propulsors, and then the components for the drive line, the shafting and transmission, and the engine or motor or prime mover uh, that actually provides the energy to the system. So you can build up the system with NAVCAD's 1D and 2D component performance models. And we'll see how that uh, reflects um, in different order models here in just a moment. And within the design spiral, which is the classical illustration I've put on the, the right-hand side, NAVCAD, uh, with its um, data exchange with cases, for example, allows you to uh, view um, early stage design studies very thoroughly and then still maintain that system throughout the different levels of the design spiral as your program matures. Now, I want to take a moment here to talk about how NAVCAD complements the CFD solvers that you might be using or might propose for, for use with cases. Uh, there's a few things that uh, NAVCAD can do in the context of CFD use with cases to actually improve the effectiveness and efficiency of your entire workflow. One is the ability to use existing or reduced sets of CFD calculations. NAVCAD has the ability to uh, conduct what's called an aligned prediction. Most frequently, this is with model test data. But what you can do is you can use sparse calculations of CFD, apply that with NAVCAD, one of its 1D and, and 2D prediction methods for bare hull resistance, for example, and use a, a reduced number of CFD calculations to bring back into the NAVCAD setting to align the reduced order calculations, the component performance models in NAVCAD.
had to really improve the um, uh, total efficiency and reduce the time to results. A very, very important part of any kind of a design spiral or evolving or mat maturing design is the ability to use uh, reduced order methods as benchmarks for the higher order calculations. We need to have an idea before we flip the switch on CFD what the answers are going to be so that we can ensure through benchmarking that our gridding is correct, our um, CFD settings for the analysis make sense. And NAVCAD can provide those benchmarks for you to establish confidence in the CFD predictions. Of course, in conjunction with CASIS, you can do design space optimization prior to employing CFD assets at all as a solver for, um, for CASIS. And I would offer that as a, an extremely valuable process to introduce into your workflow, where if you can get to a narrower design space, with the faster um, simulation that's available with NAVCAD, you can reduce the amount of time that you have to spend with um, higher order solvers. You can focus the higher order solvers on the very valuable design space that you want to optimize. And then uh, we can establish starting conditions for CFD convergence. Planing halls are a great example of this. With NAVCAD, you can come to the table with a sinkage and trim value. This is true for non-planing vessels as, as well. So that can provide starting conditions for your CFD convergence. So everything about the complementary nature of NAVCAD with CFD improves your CFD outcomes. And this last last point here is NAVCAD Premium is the one tool that hits that uh, what I term sweet spot between facility and precision, how effectiveness or capable something is and the necessary precision for the design stage that you are considering. This makes it especially valuable for early stage design. So here's some, some thoughts that I would like to share uh, for those of you actually beginning to use NAVCAD with cases about how can you best use it. Well, one thing is NAVCAD can predict a variety of performance metrics as part of the whole ship system. So uh, I was talking a moment ago about how total mission fuel consumption might be one of the, the objective functions that you would use. So the Cases optimizing ob objective functions should be based on one of the NAVCAD metrics, such as minimizing bear hull resistance for a component analysis, which is what we will see here in the case study, or perhaps a full voyage fuel consumption, where you can create a whole operating modes um, mission duty profile and then get an energy metric and minimize that as the objective function itself. So the choice of the performance measure that you use really should reflect the maturity of the design and the system characteristics. In this particular case, we're using a, a vessel with a water jet as a propulsor. Well, water jets like main engines are a component. We don't design individual impellers or nozzles or inlets. So we have to take the characteristics of the water jet as a whole. So in this particular case, it makes sense for the objective function scope to be based on a component because we're then going to plug in a water jet as a propulsor later on. Now, if we were doing propellers, for example, controllable pitch propellers, fixed pitch propellers, we might include optimization within NAVCAD of the propeller itself. So now we have kind of nested optimizations that can lead to, you know, truly optimized systems with cases for mission critical outcomes. So with the objective function scope, we talk about components leading through to system. Component optimization uh, metrics might be hull resistance or its equivalent effective power. And, and we'll want to keep that in mind. Um, 
Telfer coefficient is one that we use frequently because it normalizes resistance for displacement. It's the equivalent of, of a uh, resistance weight ratio, except that it's truly a non-dimensional coefficient, so it's unit in specific. Uh, system objective functions would be engine power, uh, fuel consumption, or even uh, emissions, which is something that we are getting into. Uh, just as a quick sidebar, we also are seeing design drivers that are not related to the traditional thoughts of efficiency, and we're beginning to use objective functions for things like hydroacoustics and underwater radiated noise. Now, the operational scope that you might want to consider when setting up your session between NAVCAD and CASIS is, do I want to look at a single design point, which is the example here, a simple weighted function, or perhaps a full operating modes analysis like I described earlier. Now, a single design point just is one speed. Now, we have a vehicle that has a principal speed as its as its mission. So a single design point is sufficient at that point. Now we can use for a component-based outcome a simple weighted function where we only have a single mode, a transit mode where we're just, just moving from point A to point B, or perhaps a towing mode where we want to look at multiple speeds and a weighted time. It's critical that, that you remember not to use resistance for this, that you use effective power. Power is a better way to communicate energy. Resistance is speed specific, so you want to actually look at what the power or equivalent energy demand is, and that's captured through the use of effective power as opposed to resistance. Um, in, in the case of a single design point, it doesn't make any difference, but if you're using multiple speeds with perhaps a simple weighted design point, you know, that uh, you want to remember to use effective power. And then a full operating modes scope, uh, multiple modes of varying transits, towing, idle, uh, uh, a vessel with a search and rescue mission is a great example of this. That wants to be time weighted and you can then look at total energy key performance indicators, even something like CO2 production as a, um, a scope for the, an operational scope for your objective function. Now, one way of improving the CASIS NAVCAD effectiveness is to do some preliminary optimization within NAVCAD before you uh, begin your um, more broad optimization within CASIS. And I would just like to introduce you to NAVCAD's drag reduction utility. This is not an optimization utility. What it is, is it takes the parameters of the prediction method chosen and it does a simple two speed uh, weighting and for your um, uh, total energy or your weighted effective power, it will look at the primary speed, the secondary speed, and give you an indicator as to how your parameter has to change. We want to increase length to reduce drag. We want to do, do decrease wetted surface, that becomes obvious, decrease displacement, that's also obvious. But we can begin to see other design um, items, half angle of entrance, uh, draft, immersed transom area that we'll see is important in this particular case, longitudinal center of buoyancy. These are things that we can then begin to use and um, as an initial guidance for how we want to set up our optimization in cases to say, you know, NAVCAD suggests we might look here. And so let cases begin to look in that domain in those regimes first. Okay, thank you, Don, for this uh, thorough introduction. Um, so let's start. Uh, looking at a uh, practical use case of this coupled system. So the example case that we uh, picked out for this is a, uh, as was mentioned already, water jet driven 
boat, a patrol boat, which uh, has a round bilge uh, hull shape with an immersed transom stern. The uh, length of the vessel overall is uh, 29 meters and the beam is 6.8 meters. And some pre preliminary uh, analysis that was done on the hull form uh, indicated in terms of speed prediction that um, 23 knots could be reached uh, as a top speed rather than the 26 knots that were promised in the tender of the vessel. So obviously you can see there is a lack of speed uh, that the vessel um, can reach. And um, one, one option uh, was that uh, for, the, for the builder of the vessel to, to introduce a larger engine. Uh, but of course, that brings a lot of negative points. And uh, so uh, it was, uh, the focus was put, let's say, first of all, on the, on the hull form to see how much uh, can we gain in terms of the hull form without having to uh, increase the engine. Uh, and also uh, in, a, in a further step to select uh, the most suited water jet uh, in combination with the hull that we have and the engine. So to, to narrow it down again, we, uh, the target was to reach the 26 knots and find the best hull form with regard to the resistance. And then afterwards uh, find the water jet uh, suited for that. So the first step uh, that we have to do for this optimization task is to, um, to get a, um, the possibility of changing the geometry of our hull form. And this can be do basically with two different approaches in cases. Uh, the first one is we set up a parametric model of the hull form. So basically we generate uh, the, the hull lines model of the hull geometry from scratch and define parameters that control uh, this geometry. And the second option are morphing or deformation uh, techniques where you import an existing hull form and apply some kind of changes uh, to the geometry. So uh, for the first approach, uh, the advanced parametric surface modeling that we offer in cases um, ha works uh, in such a way that we create, first of all, a curve template. So this is a cross section through our surface. You can see it indicated on the hull form uh, on the right. And in the bottom, you see uh, a picture of that cross section. So this is a frame uh, of our hull uh, that is controlled by some parameters. I put in here a couple of parameters, might not be all of them, but uh, to give you an idea that we can control the frame shape with parameters, things like the height, uh, the beam, uh, and so on, but also angles like the dead rise angles or integral values like the submerged area, cross-sectional area, uh, things like that. And if we move our cross section um, or frame in this case along the surface of our, of our geometry, the values of the parameters of this template will change. And that can be described through parameter distribution functions. So you see in the, uh, in the bottom in the picture, uh, some of these functions for the hull. So we have some, let's say physical uh, curves like the deck contour and the center plane curve, but also some other curves that indicate how the dead rise changes along the hull and things like that. And if we combine these two things, our cross section template and the parameter distributions in the sweep direction of the surface, we can generate our surface and Con by controlling these parameter distribution functions, we can control the shape of our surfaces. And this is a very, let's say, efficient way of describing a quite complex freeform geometry in a flexible way, but with a low number of parameters. So this is uh, something about the fully parametric modeling of a geometry. 
And in this case, actually, we use the second approach that I introduced, which is the morphing. So we have an existing geometry, a baseline geometry for this hull, and we would like to apply some changes to this imported geometry. And here I have some animations that show the parameters that we were able to change. The first, of, first is uh, length. So this is basically a simple scaling of the geometry in longitudinal direction. Then uh, we have the ability to change the beam of the vessel. So also sort of scaling in uh, transverse direction. Then the third parameter is the draft of the transom. So we can control the immersion, immersion, immersion of the transom, sorry. You, as you can see in the animation here. Uh, then the, the dead rise at the transom can be changed. The shape of the deck and the design waterline. So basically, uh, I hope you can see it uh, well enough in these animations. It's basically also um, similar to a scaling, but it's more localized. So that bas basically we increase the the beam at the uh, maximum beam position of the deck, and that also has an impact on the design waterline shape. So they're, uh, let's say, changed uh, together. And uh, finally, we have the volume distribution. So here we, uh, we redistribute a volume of the hull in longitudinal direction. So basically, uh, this has an effect on the center of buoyancy also. Well, once we have our uh, variable geometry model that can be controlled by parameters, so when we change the parameters, we can obtain different variants of our uh, hull form. Once we have that, we need to export the geometry to our downstream tools that make the performance assessment. And uh, the, the geometry can be exported in, let's say, different types of generic formats like IGES, STEP, STL, and so on, so all let's say surface-based formats, or in this case, um, we transfer the geometry to NAFCAT using a sp specialized input script that contains all the necessary information about the geometry, um, and that in cases is automatically filled with new data for each hull variant during the optimization process. So what you can see here on the on the right is the user interface of this um, customized uh, export uh, that we have written. And here you can fill in a couple of uh, data uh, that is necessary. You can provide uh, the hull form geometry, uh, sp specify the hull type, the prediction method that you want to run, um, and then this, uh, this export function will generate a script that looks similar to what you can see in, here in the picture that contains uh, all the information for NAVCAT and also uh, controls the NAVCAT process. And just to highlight here specifically, uh, what, uh, what is also transferred here is uh, the shape of the hull in terms of data at specific longitudinal positions. So we have, uh, first of all, a list of longitudinal positions, and then uh, we provide uh, the beam, uh, the waterline beam at that position, uh, the, the cross-sectional area, and also the centroid position of that cross-sectional area below the waterline. And this is basically what you see here in the, pl in the plots uh, at the bottom, and this gives NAFCAT all the information it needs about the of the shape of the hull. So this is how we transfer the geometry and uh, to connect the two tools, we use our so-called software connector, which is the generic interface I mentioned at the beginning to connect cases to external uh, tools. And this is a, let's say, generic view here uh, that shows the four quadrants that we have in the software connector in the in the 
top two one, we have all the input that is supplied to the external tool, the geometry on the one side, uh, and also all the additional input files that we need uh, on, in, on the other side. And in the bottom, we, we can specify all the result files that we want to load into cases after the calculation has been finished to evaluate uh, certain uh, values for our optimization process. So on the one side, we can provide uh, files that are read in as whole. So you can create screenshots, you can uh, import flow fields uh, from your CFD solver to do post-processing in cases, things like that. And on the other side, we can specify specific values that we want to read from a file to be used for, uh, as an example, as an objective function. This is how the software connector looks like for the NAVCAD uh, case. So uh, in our input file quadrant, we have the script file that was gener that is generated by this uh, automated tool I showed you before. Uh, here in the middle, we have the link to the executable, which is uh, a special executable that runs NAVCAD with the script. Um, and then we have um, some screenshots that we're loading as a result file, uh, as well as a, a text file that contains output values that we read into cases to use uh, as an objective for the optimization. Okay, and now I would like to give back to Don, who will tell us a little bit about the computations that we're doing within NAVCAD in this case, and then we continue with the optimization. Sure, thanks, Mattia. Um, just a couple slides here to uh, describe the methodology and the application of the methods that will be used inside of NAVCAD for this. Uh, Mattia mentioned how they are capturing distributed volume data and other parametric data of the whole form and passing that into NAVCAD. <clears throat> well, the kind of data that is used, I wanted to uh, describe the two component prediction options for bear hole resistance here as a, as a way to, to introduce you to the, the idea of 1D parameter-based predictions and 2D volume-based predictions. A parameter based is one that um, most people will be uh, very familiar with, uh, very popular methods uh, that might be based on systematic series or random data methods where the data is in a one dimensional parametric form, a length, a beam, a draft, displacement, max section area, longitudinal center buoyancy, for example. The prediction are empirical. Uh, that they use statistical methods of systematic series or a variety of different hull forms in order to take these parameters, uh, typically create uh, polynomial functions or, or other kind of statistical based functions to create a prediction. Now that has a scope. Uh, and in the case of NAVCAD, uh, we have some 40 different parametric 1D based prediction methods for hull form that will support, you know, small go fast planing hulls all the way through to the largest tankers and bulkers. A volume based prediction is uh, what we're calling um, a 2D method. Really, we're looking at the hole in the water, the immersed volume. And because in cases we have the ability to refine geometry with longitudinal distributions, unlike uh, higher order solvers where they're looking at the surface envelope, what we're doing is we're looking at the, the longitudinal distribution of the immersed volume. And inside of NAVCAD, we call that our analytical distributed volume method, which is a, a novel linear wave making code uh, that uh, has appropriate uh, corrections uh, for a variety of viscous drag contributions of form, boundary layer thickness, et cetera. But also it, it has predictions for sinkage and trim corrections so that throughout the speed range and throughout 
the vessel types, you can uh, use the analytical distributed volume method to look at refinements in hull forms and outcomes in a, in a much more detailed way, yet still to be extremely fast and time efficient. Another advantage of this kind of a 2D method is that it's very well behaved. And in the, in the graphic on the lower right there, what I have done is shown a stern with a propeller pocket, very popular for motor yachts and patrol craft, for example, um, with uh, a conventional shaft driven propellers. Well, if the water plane were or a water line slice were to happen to go through that, you can see that there is shape discontinuity in that slice that does not allow a lot of other comparable um, linear codes to to function properly by looking only at sectional area, water plane distribution, and the and the vertical immersion of the of the sectional areas, we eliminate those problems. And so this method is extremely well behaved and provides uh, no disruption in an optimizing session where you're going to be looking at many many different variants. The application that we would propose and, and used here in this particular example is to employ the hull variation changes that you get with CASIS uh, by pre-establishing the project settings uh, using the NAVCAD interface, uh, an example of which is shown here. So we would propose to set up an initial project file template that you would you would begin with and then allow the hull form to change iteratively for each variant session from NAVCAD um, inside of CASIS and let CASIS indicate here's the new hull, here's, um, oh, here's an opportunity to recalculate that, let me capture the results for this modified hull. So units, vessel speeds, water properties would all be common uh, we would propose to define any environmental drags that you want to consider if you're looking at a system-based prediction, uh, adder resistances in wind, sea, shallow water, for example, any appendages that you might have. In this particular case, uh, where we're looking at a single duty point, um, uh, or, I'm sorry, a single design point and water jet driven, we don't have to worry about uh, those kinds of, of added resistances. We're going to use the ADVM method as described for resistance and set up our preferences for the kind of viscous expansion that we want to use for presentation of the results. Uh, what prediction of form factor will we use, a correlation allowance, friction line, all of those changes the way the results are are presented. And then we can save this NAVCAD project file as the calculation template uh, for the analysis of all the variants that we will get through our cases session. Exactly. And uh, that brings me to the next step, um, the generation of all the variants and the optimization process. So um, in terms of the optimization setup, we uh, saw before when I uh, introduced the geometry variation that we have three, uh, sorry, we have six free variables uh, for our hull form. And we have some constraints on displacement and center of buoyancy. So we are only allowing small changes in these values. And um, our objectives specifically are the resistance at 22 and 30 knots. So we're evaluating the resistance of the vessel at these two speeds and trying to minimize it. And in terms of the process, uh, we ran a DOE or we started the process with the DOE uh, of 500 designs, which is very quickly, of course, before because the calculations here are uh, done uh, in very, very rapidly. And uh, 
we follow up this uh, DOE with a local optimization. So when we have identified some good areas in our design space through the DOE, we can run local optimization within this area. Uh, in, the, in the table here at the right, you can see the design space. So the lower and upper bounds of uh, the different values. Some of them are the, let's say the input variables that we're using. Some are outputs of the system. Um, but this is, so to say, the design space that we're covering with, uh, with our DOE, uh, okay, yeah, DOE setup. So uh, once we, uh, we ran uh, the process, we can, of course, get specific results. So we, we would be able to get an optimized design as a result. But also an interesting point uh, that we already get in the meantime, also as a result of our preliminary DOE, is uh, that we can uh, identify very well uh, the, the influence of the different free variables on our resistance objective. So as you can see here in the picture on the right, um, we have some correlation plots uh, that show the correlation between the design variables that are uh, shown in the column headers um, and our uh, objective functions that are in the row, uh, row headers here. And uh, here we can see, I mean, these are not all the free variables, but a few of them. And we can see that we have a strong influence of the transom draft or the immersion of the transom, as you can see from these diagram. So uh, that has a strong uh, linear correlation to the Telfer coefficient at 22 and 30 knots. Um, we have a, let's say, medium influence of the transom dead rise angle. So there is certainly um, a, um, an influence, but it's less pronounced as the transom draft. And other things uh, like the deck and design waterline shape that are controlled by one variable, this is the shift deck here, uh, have a negligible influence on, on these results. So this is the kind of uh, knowledge that you can gain uh, by, by looking at the results and understanding how your system reacts to certain changes. Finally, of course, as I mentioned, we also obtained a specific optimized design, which <clears throat> we can see uh, here in comparison to the uh, parent or baseline design. So in the first uh, column here with values, we have the, uh, the particulars of our parent design. And then in the last column, we have the uh, values for our proposed optimized design. And if we look at the results here in the geometric comparison, uh, what we just saw in the figures. Uh, the changes that were introduced is uh, we have a slightly more slender hull with a narrower entrance. Um, the transom area is, uh, the immersed transom area is bigger. We saw that the transom draft had a significant influence and our longitudinal center of buoyancy is shifted slightly aft, and we have a little bit more displacement overall for the vessel. So uh, in terms of the results, you can see here the resistance plots over a range of speed for the parent hull in red and the optimized hull in green. So uh, here we see nicely that over the whole speed range, the resistance was reduced. And if we have a certain, let's say, resistance budget uh, that we can uh, overcome with our propulsion power, then uh, we are able to increase the speed significantly above or beyond the 26 knots that was uh, required for the vessel. And uh, also, if we look at the Telfer coefficient, we can see that uh, the optimized hull uh, was improved uh, over the whole uh, fruit number range. And again, 
we uh, are able to achieve a higher fruit number. And specifically, if we look at the improvement at 30 knots, which was one of the targets, uh, target speeds for which we optimized. If you remember, we had a resistance at 22 and 30 knots at, as the objectives for the optimization. Uh, here we can see that the Telfer coefficient uh, was reduced by 8.2%. There is also the explanation of the Telfer uh, coefficient if you're not familiar with it. So uh, this was the resistance optimization that we performed uh, on the vessel. And now uh, the last step was to select a more suitable water jet for this optimized hull. And that uh, Don will tell us something about that. Certainly, just a brief comment on how water jets are dealt with and in the context of this particular um, uh, case study example. Uh, can you advance the slide, please? Yes. As mentioned earlier, water jet performance is not conducted in a first principles way like we might do for propeller design, but it is a component that we have to select, you know, you unique individual product models from manufacturers and they produce data uh, for that purpose, you know, speed, thrust, power, RPM against uh, different impeller types. And so even so, we can use different water jets singularly as part of the optimization because we can then compare once we have a, a improvements in the hull form, we can then look at that improved hull against our collection of the different available water jets, find the water jet that achieves the highest efficiency at that speed, which is one one characteristic of analysis with water jets that's often missing is that the speed thrust power RPM data that is given, you need to evaluate that in a different form in order to extract efficiency, propulsor efficiency from that. So you may be, uh, as was the case with the initial client of this case study, they were using a water jet that was optimized for 3540 knots. It was very, very poor in its efficiency in the 25 to 30 knot range. And so by applying a different water jet and NAVCAD being able to extract what the propulsor efficiency actually is at that point, the user can then go and select a water jet model to combine with this optimized hull form. And not only that, you can put that in the context of the entire hull propulsor driveline engine system uh, with, the, with the central graphic there. What you can see is that the derivative and final engine power and RPM versus speed can be laid over the engine's um, um, power curve, uh, the delivery power curve to ensure that you have the right impeller to ensure that you're able to meet speed. And this is showing that the combination of the optimized hull, the newly selected water jet, and the, the engine that was defined will be able to meet a slightly in excess of 26 knots, which was the design objective. Okay. So let's come to the final results. Um, first of all, um, let's say by, by doing all these uh, different steps in the process, uh, the, the, in the end, the result is some significant cost savings in, in different fields. Uh, so first of all, in terms of capital expenses when building the vessel, um, we the, the vessel is supposed to be equipped with two engines uh, that are, let's say, in a in a range of $100,000 each. And the original expectation of the client when uh, it was noticed that the vessel fell short, it was going to fall short of the speed uh, target, the original expectation was to install an engine that was about 20% larger, which if we scale linearly uh, is uh, about $20,000 increase in price per engine. So by not uh, having to install a larger engine, uh, 
the saving is about forty thousand dollars for the engines only and um, another factor is the cost savings uh, in operational expenses so the uh, prediction for the fuel consumption that NAVCAD gives us at 20 knots which is the mean cruising speed of the vessel uh, is about 252 liters per hour for the parent design and 185 liters per hour for the proposed design uh, per engine that is and uh, if we estimate uh, uh, 500 hours per year of operating demand of the vessel and an average cost of marine diesel fuel of uh, 1.05 dollars per liter that's a, let's say worldwide average figure uh, then we we reach uh, savings in operational expenses of 72 thousand dollars for the fuel and we can possibly expect some further benefit uh, from the lighter design because we have smaller engines um, and slightly higher payload possibly of the vessel but that's uh, not part of the uh, calculation here so to summarize the conclusions um, NAVCAD and cases have been successfully uh, utilized in a coupled solution for the optimization of the ship hull the data exchange that's an important factor between the two programs was automated so that it's very easy uh, in the automated process to transfer uh, geometry data and result data back and forth uh, between the two programs and finally the design challenge of a patrol boat that was uh, falling short of the promised maximum speed could be solved in a two-step process by optimizing the hull for lower resistance and um, employing more suitable water jet uh, selected by NAVCAD. And the target speed could be reached, even exceeded a little bit, and uh, substantial cost savings for uh, yeah, operational costs and capital expenses uh, were achieved. So this is the conclusion uh, of the webinar, of the content of the webinar. If you liked what you saw today and you think uh, it's interesting, either the combination of the two tools or the two individual tools, uh, then if you would like to get to know these, uh, these tools uh, more and also find out about the, the licensing options that uh, we, we can give you for these tools, uh, feel free to contact us at Friendship Systems through sales at friendshipsystems.com or uh, Hydrocomp through sales at hydrocompinc.com and then we will be happy to, to help you with that. Uh, of course, if you're not familiar with either one of these systems, um, an option to get started is to run a project together where you can find out on your specific example how these tools work and if they work well for you. And if you're interested in getting uh, one of these tools, then you can use the promotion code SPRING18 until the end of April to get a 50% reduction in price on an annual lease license of cases or of the premium version of NAVCAD. So we are already slightly uh, beyond our finish time. I would still, I think we, we don't have so many uh, questions, but uh, I'll try, I want to try to address some of these. We have uh, one question from uh, Chris, which is, can CFD and NAVCAT be combined in one cases uh, setup? So, the, the answer is yes. Um, I mean, the advantages of this combination have been mentioned, mentioned by Don before. And in terms of uh, technical, um, how things work technically, then of course it's possible in one case project to set up multiple software connectors in a similar way as I showed here on the example of NAVCAD so that you can couple cases to multiple tools within one optimization setup and you can also prescribe 
a certain uh, a certain sequence of execution of the different tools for each variant. In, uh, then we have another question from Alvaro, uh, which are are the surfaces generated as NURBS surfaces in cases? So the answer is yes. Uh, the modeling kernel, cat kernel that we have uh, at the basis of cases is a NURBS kernel. So everything that is generated is NURBS uh, geometry and will be exported into a IGES or STEP format and so on in as a NURBS surface. So, um, I have a question from Saba about the correlation matrix that I showed on page 33 of the presentation. Let me go back here. This is the correlation matrix, uh, why uh, the correlation values are not displayed here. We, I mean, we see the graphs, uh, the regression uh, plots, the blue and uh, linear regression, red is the quadratic regression. And actually the background color of these graphs, the orange, green, yellow color, that's, uh, that shows the correlation coefficient. So um, it's shown in the picture, but maybe uh, it's not quite clear if you don't know it. Uh, so we, if we have a reddish U in the background, that's a big positive correlation. A blue color is a negative correlation and yellow greenish colors are in between. Um, we have, um, the some questions here, let me see. Um, I think what, what is the Telfer coefficient that was answered? Um, why uh, weren't the midship parameters uh, not included in the variables? A question, question from Igor, um, this, uh, this is simply based on the choice that was made here. Of course, you can uh, set up a, vari a variable for the midship coefficient, either by defining some deformations that are applied to the midship area, as we did here in, in this case, or if you have a parametric model of the vessel, then one of the parameters that define the geometry can be the midship, uh, midship parameters, values. So, so I think that's simply the choice that was made uh, here. And maybe one question to you, Don, or, or did you want to comment on this? Yes, I did. I did, okay. in fact. Um, it's a great question. Midship coefficient, in particular, is one of those things that can be somewhat deceptive uh, in evaluating hull forms. Um, if you might slide back a couple slides here to the prediction methodology page, just because we have a graphic there. Right. Um, what we're really interested, again, is, is the hole in the water. And for uh, hulls that are, are like the one that we were using in the case study, a round bilge transom stern, you know, traditionally falling in that semi-displacement regime, the midship position becomes largely irrelevant hydrodynamically. So the alternative to that is to use maximum section area, which in the in the case of the blue line here, the sectional area curve, we can see and identify what the maximum section area is going to be. However, that value can also be at a point where the draft is not maximum or the beam is not maximum. You have variations in shape that, particularly for hulls of this type, that a, a shape function that you're trying to use to describe kind of the, the, the central girth of the ship uh, 
um, sometimes overly constrains what you what what you actually want in in terms of an outcome. So uh, to keep whole geometry as simple as possible, I think it's important to to um, have an objective in setting up the the CAD geometry at, for, for optimization studies that you look for um, a set of parameters or a parent shape that is really CAD friendly and morphing friendly, that you don't over constrain it, that you try to use the understanding of the physics of, of hydrodynamics to reflect some of those things that we know are going to have an influence, transom immersion, longitudinal center of buoyancy, um, the fineness of the nose, and not to overly constrain the hull so that cases can do its job and really find those shapes in conjunction with a a code like our analytical distributed volume method in NAVCAD to to fit the shape of the immersed volume into an an optimized setting. Okay, thanks. Um, I I would just take one uh, last. There's a few more questions coming in, coming in. Uh, since we're already 10 minutes past the time, or a bit more than 10 minutes, I would. There's one last question that I would like uh, to answer, and um, and then we will follow up on any question that have remained open here. The uh, question here from Philip is, is it necessary to specify a range for a constraint such as a displacement or can an equals constraint be used? Uh, for example, maintain a set target displacement or draft. Um, it's, I mean, it's not necessary to set a range. Um, sometimes there is a certain tolerance that is allowed uh, for some of these values and then it's uh, let, let's say it gives you more flexibility if you can make use uh, of that tolerance. So um, let's say if uh, a little bit more or less displacement is uh, n not a problem, then why not giving that freedom so that you are able to uh, to ex have a wider uh, design space uh, that you can explore. But if you have a really tight constraint uh, on a value like displacement, then of course there is also the possibility of of keeping it exactly fixed. And we have also some uh, special methods in cases uh, where you can make sure that w when you're doing changes to certain parts of the hull uh, that you do some, uh, let's say, post-processing uh, on the hull uh, that readjusts uh, the displacement to a fixed value, for example. So uh, you can also define the constraint as fixed, but then uh, as an equal constraint. But uh, if you don't have anything that counteracts possible changes in displacement, then it will be very difficult during the optimization to keep it exactly fixed. One. One quick comment on that. When when we started this project, actually, we went at it with the idea of using an equivalency on on a displacement to be fair to the the um, original objectives of the design. But what we learned was that it in the in the hunt for variations that hit the volume exactly, uh, we were running many, many more, more iterations and, um, and variations than we needed to be. So the use of the Telfer coefficient, which normalizes resistance by vessel displacement, is a great way to improve the effectiveness of this kind of an analysis, because now you're looking at a, at a normalized resistance. So in this particular case, our final hull was a few tons larger than our our initial parent 
a displacement. And one way to resolve that is, is once the optimum shape is, is resolved, we can just use a scaling, a geosim scaling to bring it down to the final displacement if we felt we needed to. Uh, so um, another example of, of over constraining something can, can sometimes make things work too hard. Okay, thank you very much. At this point, I would like to conclude the webinar. Um, as I said, we can be in touch about any questions that were uh, left open here or that might come up after the webinar. Um, just one, one short um, um, request from my side. Uh, there is a, sh a short survey that will pop up uh, when you close the, the webinar. So, of course, I I'd appreciate your feedback there. Here I'm showing again our contact information. So uh, where we would be happy to hear from you and to start working with you and see how we can help you in your design tasks. And uh, with that, I would like to say goodbye. And uh, I hope to see you in another upcoming webinar um, or to hear from you. Bye-bye.